Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to tell you a story today um, about full faith and credit. In 2013, I purchased a complete set of the laws of the state of Georgia, the official code of Georgia annotated, for $1,107.09. I scanned the 48 volumes, posted them on the net, and put a copy of those scans on a George Washington USB drive and sent it to the Speaker of the House of Georgia. The Speaker was not amused. He fired back an angry cease and desist letter insisting that the offending materials were the sole and exclusive property of the state of Georgia, which had granted exclusive resale rights to the Lexus Corporation, and that we should heretofore remove said materials forthwith from the internet or face unspecified but certainly dire consequences. Uh, we respectfully um, declined to comply explaining our radical position that the law belongs to the people, and then sent further copies of the code out to legal aid groups, public defenders, mayors, and libraries throughout Georgia. Many more letters uh, flew back and forth, and on July 21st, 2015, the state of Georgia served papers on my person, alleging in the complaint a practice by me of, quote, terrorism, as evidenced by my wanton and flagrant practice of unlicensed promulgation. The state asserted ownership over 22 categories of official annotations, ranging from section titles to code commission guidance to history logs to attorney general opinions to summaries of judicial cases, all of which they said were subject to copyright, all rights reserved in the name of the state of Georgia. We lost very quickly in the district court. I basically pleaded no contest. I did the deed. Judge Story, uh, that's his real name, said there was no excuse for this behavior, and he slapped a federal injunction on me, ordering me to remove from the internet all evidence of the law of Georgia over which I had control. We appealed to the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, where we were joined by the ACLU in oral argument, and we won. Uh, Georgia filed for cert in the US Supreme Court, and we did something that usually isn't done by the winner in the court below. We urged the court to take our case. The Supreme Court accepted our plea and we prevailed. The court agreed with our position that these were edicts of government, which are the law and legal materials issued in the name of the state. Under a 200-year-old common law doctrine, edicts of government are not eligible for copyright protection. The government edicts doctrine precedes and supersedes the powers of the Congress to grant copyright under Article I Section 8, and that is because edicts of government are fundamental to our democracy. Promulgation of the law is a fundamental tenet of the rule of law. Promulgation of the law is integral to free speech, to commerce among the states, to due process, and to access to justice. In the United States, the law belongs to the people. We won in Georgia, but I still cannot get an up-to-date copy of the official Code of Georgia annotated. Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the majority, said I didn't have to settle for, quote, economy class access to the law. He gave me an upgrade to first class, but apparently the Lexus Corporation does not recognize the Supreme Court's frequent filer program. The current OCGA is only available on the Lexus Corporation site, where they offer law as a service, law that is subject to strict terms of use, a substantial rental fee, and technical measures that prohibit downloading and repurposing. It is read-only law. It's like a Netflix movie, which you can only view on a properly registered viewer. If you have been authorized and authenticated, but guess what, don't blink twice, your movie may soon disappear. Georgia is not the only state that asserts copyright in the name of the state over edicts of government. Mississippi is adamant that not only the annotated code, but the black letter law, the statutes, are their private property, as are all the state regulations. Idaho, Tennessee, Arkansas, and New Mexico all assert copyright over the codes. The U.S. Copyright Office liberally grants new registrations over these public properties, despite the Supreme Court ruling. The same situation applies for jury instructions, written mainly by judges in the course of their official duties, copyrighted in the name of the state, 
and then given to Lexis or West for their exclusive sale. When you see copyright Supreme Court of Kansas or copyright unified court system of New York, that is theoretically impossible as a phrase under the government edicts doctrine. But there you go, the keep off the grass signs are impossible to miss. So what can we do about this situation? I believe the answer is staring us right in the face. And it is contained in the full faith and credit clause of the US Constitution. That clause has two sentences. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. The second sentence reads, and the Congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved in the effect thereof. So let's look at those two sentences. The first is a self-executing clause. It was meant to handle cases such as debts, where a state court ruled that a debt was valid and must be paid, but the debtor fled to another state with different laws. It also applies to matrimonial issues, contracts, and other nuts and bolts issues that present themselves in the state courts. More recently, the issue has arisen in the context of the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. So what does full faith and credit mean? As with many important constitutional concepts, the meaning was and is still vague and ambiguous. When James Madison pulled this clause out of the Articles of Confederation, the term full faith and credit was an evidentiary standard, but Madison conceded in the Federalist Papers that the meaning was, quote, extremely indeterminate. Finding the law in those days was difficult. Professor Sachs, in his excellent history of the clause, explains how difficult it was for many years after the founding to get ac ac accurate copies of even federal laws. You could get an authenticated copy from the Department of State, but for state decisions, they were often copied by hand, subject to mistakes, and difficult to find and authenticate. Justice Joseph's story complained bitterly about the, quote, loose and irregular condition of legal materials. There is still debate about the basic meaning of the term full faith and credit in the first sentence, but it is clear that Congress is empowered in the second sentence to impose additional requirements. The first sentence is a baseline, but the second sentence is what Professor Tribe described as a one-way ratchet in a letter to Senator Edward Kennedy in regards to DOMA. You can't weaken the first sentence, but you can strengthen it with the powers granted in the second. For me, that second sentence is all about promulgation of the law, and I believe the answer is a full faith and credit act. The act would specify that any edict of government, including those issued by the states and local jurisdictions, are subject to mandatory deposit with the government publishing office. A government may pass any law it deems appropriate, and the appropriateness is, of course, a matter for the courts, but if an edict is issued, it must be sent to the GPO. GPO already does an amazingly good job in this respect with many federal materials, laws and bills, the congressional record, the federal register, the code of federal regulations, the US code, congressional hearings and reports, the statutes at large, and much more are all readily available. Under the Full Faith and Credit Act, the responsibility of the government publishing office would be expanded to include all edicts of government, state court dockets, the federal PACER system, jury instructions, building codes, state laws, hearings, regulations, attorney general opinions, municipal codes, everything, the works. GPO would be mandated to provide bulk access with a clueful application programming interface, metadata in JSON and XML formats, all digitally signed with the GPO seal of approval. And I am convinced that James Madison would endorse this proposition. And I'm also sure that any literalist would have to agree that the Constitution clearly gives the Congress this power, indeed compels it to act. Without taking these steps, the first sentence is but an unfulfilled mandate. If we believe that Congress may regulate commerce among the states, making the laws of those states available is crucial, for the law is the rule book that governs commerce. If we believe in the rule of law, we should heed the words of Lord Thomas Bingham in his excellent book on the subject when he says promulgation is the essential ingredient of the rule of law. There can be no rule of law 
if the law itself is not available? If ignorance of the law is no excuse, how can we have access to justice and due process if the law is locked behind a paywall and subject to onerous and arbitrary terms of use by private parties? In a democracy, we must have the right not only to read the law, but to speak the law, to communicate our rights and obligations to our fellow citizens. This is about access to justice, but it's also about innovation in our legal system. In 1876, because state court opinions were not subject to copyright, John B. West was able to create the national reporter system. He was the face of innovation for the practice of law. He didn't need a license to create this magnificent legal edifice then, but he would today. Under the Full Faith and Credit Act, the legal services industry will see the full flowering of innovation. This step will not only be good for democracy, it'll be good for business. It will be good for established players like the Lexus Corporation, as well as new startups like Ravel. Today, exclusive access to our legal materials have been granted to private players, each of which hides the law in private silos. The natural resource that is our legal system, the raw materials of our democracy, have been fenced off and privatized. In his 1944 Cardozo lecture, Justice Robert H. Jackson said, the full faith and credit clause is the foundation of any hope we may have for a truly national system of justice based on the preservation, but better integration of the local jurisdictions we have. It's time at long last to fully implement the full faith and credit clause. It's time to nationalize the law to make this public resource truly public. And this I put to you, this is the future of open access to the law. This is how we can begin to transform justice. Thank you.